Hello my fellow monster enthusiasts! Before we begin the Nightmare Fuel, I'm proud to let you know that this video is sponsored by 1985 Games. Our sponsor confetti! Yay! They're announcing their line of new Dungeon Craft tiles, a book of easy to transport reusable terrain pieces for you to add some color to your D&D maps. I can verify that they are actually dry erasable, unlike some products out there. So get yourself some vibrant tiles that'll at least anyone's eye stocks. They're having a sale this month where you can get a free mimic pin by using the code JessChaktaw. So get your DM a copy with the link in the description below. All right, boys and ghouls, it's time to brew together something unpleasant. I will be rolling on two separate D100 tables, one with Pokemon, the other with classic D&D creatures and combine the result into something that will scare the scabbards off your players. As always, stat blocks are in the description, so let us begin. First up is 85, which is Breloom. Aww. Wait, 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 this has happened before. I don't trust it. <laughs> All right, second roll. All right, uh, 39, yep. Um, okay, that is, oh, cut. <laughs> every, okay, every time I think it's gonna be cute, it's it ends up it ends up fail. Okay, I just need to have no expectations. Okay, Death Tyrant is pretty amazing, so let's do them both justice. Ah, uh, Breloom, the mushroom Pokemon, a bizarre mix of grass and fighting that results in a huggable creature design that sheds deadly spores from its tail stalk. The Death Tyrant, inversely, is a beholder that thought giving Lich to a shot sounded like a nice nightmare to have. So, to marry to the two together in an awful union, I give you the mad trip. There are reasons you should never give shrooms to a beholder. The feverish dreams that transpire may result in the putrid scourge known as the mad trip. The embodiment of pestilence and rot, this floating fungi slinks into forests and rots all life around its pustulant form. The air of a mad trip's lair grows thick and caustic, blotting out the sun and ensuring underdark flora and fauna have a place to thrive, even on the surface. Those that survive long enough to behold these vitriolic aberrations soon succumb to the many deadly gases hissing from its spindly stalks. These otherworldly toxins can cause nightmarish hallucinations, vile curses, or even cause adventurers to vomit more fungal enemies to fight. Some mad trips enjoy slowly suffocating their victims using their long, tube-like stem, parading them around against their will like a false body. For the mad trip's only love is decay, which it inflicts with voracious delight. Oh god, uh... Um, let's move on to our next roll, which is 56. All right, uh, that is Scolipede. Oh, that's, that's one of my favorites from 5th gen. That's nice. Okay, so next uh, is number nine, which is Wyvern. Oh, oh snap. Oh god, it's a bug dragon. Oh, I am, I'm so, I'm so down for this. <laughs> so yeah, let's. Let's get going. All right, so on the one hand, we have a giant venom spewing centipede, and on the other, we have a tameable flying dragon mount. Uh, both are fairly straightforward creatures that handle domestication quite nicely. And since I absolutely love Japanese yokai, and this was just begging for it, I had to base this fusion on the legendary giant centipede dragon, the Omukade. Slithering between the mountains, a terrible scourge descends from the heavens to prey upon small villages. With a mighty dive, it wipes out entire battalions by sweeping up foes in a deadly, many-legged embrace. Venomous, acidic blood courses through the feverish Omukade, and piercing its hide may slowly dissolve its hostages. Though despite the overwhelming presence these dragons hold in the wild, a group of clever kobolds discover the beasts have a strong aversion to, of all things, saliva. 
Using this knowledge, kobold trappers were able to tame and ride the first of many Amukade, as these intelligent creatures respond rather well to positive reinforcement. Trained Omukade can even fly with up to 10 passengers, very large cargo crate distances, and drop explosives on enemies with a simple command. In some monster-governed cities, the Omukade are used as common public transportation. So long as adventurers don't mind the grasping embrace of a giant flying centipede bus. <laughs> Alright, next roll is... 100! That's 100! Oh, it looks weird. Um, whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, alright, critical 100 is a... Uh, Houndoom! Oh, yeah! <laughs> Uh, then the next is... Rolling it... Uh, that's... that's one! I think? Yeah, th yeah! Looks a little weird with these D10s. We got two- wait, we got two criticals! <laughs> so wait, okay, number one is Owlbear. That's, um... that's pretty cool! We got <laughs> both ends of the spectrum. Alright, ah... Uh, we make the best pet ever. Let's do this. <laughs> Man, these are both classics. Houndoom being one of the first dark types introduced to the series and was a popular Pokemon for Team Rocket admins. Owlbears are an absolute staple for D&D, although despite their popularity, their lore and stats are a bit lackluster. Uh, their defining feature is that they're a product of mismanaged transmogrification. So uh, let's add a bit to that with the snarling scamp known as the Slaghund. Did you ever ask yourself, what if there was a fast rust monster that set people on fire? Well, the slag hunt is for you. A combination of feral fiend and savage owlbear, this wizard experiment gone wrong is the id to the tatzel worm's ego. This beast is a pyromaniac that loves to set things ablaze for its own amusement and will melt an adventurer's armor in seconds given the chance. The calling card of the chaotic Slaghund is a trail of scorching footprints amongst a sea of spreading flames. This arsonist will stampede through a town and kick up a swelling fire, hissing a laugh as civilians scatter. Slaghunds are much like destructive children and seek attention above all else. The crux of the Slaghund, however, are those that do not fear its fire and wound its pride. Some say it's possible to quell the beast's fury by simply appreciating its rather destructive art form. Warm regards to the adventurers thick enough to tame this chaotic fusion of fiend and friend. Oh snap, we've uh, we've got a pretty good haul, honestly. Not to jinx it though. All right, rolling our fourth roll is. 46, which is Delibird. Okay, that's not, that's a pretty cute Pokemon. Uh, as cursed to the statement that is that it just came out of my mouth. Uh, let's uh, quickly roll the next one before it takes hold. Okay, uh, 22, uh, which is Flail Snail. Okay, that's, that's a cute, that's cute. I did that with Puffin. So yeah, so although, mm, a Santa Penguin crossed with a giant Death Snail. Let's do it. While Delibird isn't exactly a top-tier Pokemon-wise, it does come with a unique move called Present, which can both damage and heal enemies. It doesn't really work in Pokemon battles, but it could make for a fun encounter in D&D, especially when it ties into the cool spellbender that is the Flail Snail. So let's journey deep underground and discover the cavern's chaotic catalyst, the Smallisk. The Smollisk is a tiny creature with a unique taste for potent flora. In the dusky Underdark Caverns, it placidly sheds a dull glow from its shell, and it spends most of its time feeding on various dangerous fungi. Its favorite food is the incredibly spicy gas spore, whose explosive sting is recycled into a cocktail the Smollisk stores in its shell and tendrils. This bizarre snail secretes a sticky slime trail that is highly coveted on the black market for its unique kick. Unbeknownst to most adventurers spending coin with reckless abandon, the smallest's excretion is eerily similar to a potion of healing and carries with it the same rejuvenating benefits. However, this ooze is chemically identical to a magical nitroglycerin 
and may explode if shaken. Adventurers are advised to only engage in light activity after consuming a small slime or risk detonating from both ends. Good luck getting your refund from that charismatic shopkeeper if you survive. The least he could do is buy you a change of pants. Alright, moving ever onward. Okay, to our final monstrosity. Okay, rolling it. That is 82, which is... Licky Licky. Cool. I mean, it's kind of cute, but... Mm, okay, what is crossed with 14? Which is a mimic. <laughs> okay, um... This... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, players. <laughs> god. Oh, good god. Licky Licky is a bigger, more terrifying lick -a tongue whose internal organs are mostly tongue and whose digestive juices are incredibly potent. And then Mimics are transformable putty with huge mouths and tongues. This is a mildly redundant fusion, which can make things trickier. But regardless, here we descend into the terrifying parasite, the Speech Leech. Deep in the dusty tomes of monster-enthused archmages, a small document details a peculiar new subspecies of mimic. Once thought to be a rare disease, this smaller mimic starts its life in the mouth of another. A tiny bead of saliva left behind on the crust of bread triggers its mimicry impulse. The tiny imposter assumes the form of a tasty meal and waits for another to consume it. It sheds the bulk of its mass to be digested by its host, but a small portion latches onto the base of its tongue and replaces it. This is where the speech leech earns its namesake. Unlike most mimics who start anew with each divide, the speech leech retains the knowledge with each separation, resulting in a network of compounding intelligence. Its specialization, linguistics. To the leech, this host is merely a means of gleaning new information, which to the host's dismay, often involves seizing control of their vocal cords to complain that their shared meals are unsatisfactory. On the plus side, this silver-tongued orator will happily teach their host proper diction, and even translate rare languages to pay for its unusual lodging. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, I'm happy people seem to like this series, um, but that doesn't mean that the others are dead. Uh, I'll be releasing both episodes of Rabbit Hole simultaneously later this month, plus hopefully something new to the D&D animated series. I don't know, we'll see how it goes. This time involving warlocks, because I, I love them, they're the best. Especially big thanks to my Patreons. Holy crap, I'm gonna have to research how to livestream if this uh, if this keeps up, so I'm so grateful for you guys. It blows my mind. Thank you. Um, also, special thanks to 1985 Games for sponsoring this video. Uh, please check out their tiles. They're awesome. So thank you, my monsters, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!